Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm going to put uh, this document in the Pre-Residency Audio Academy. My uh, real responsibility here is to help pre-pharmacy students and you know, kind of help them with their continued success as, as we go through. So I want to be able to show them things like this as we kind of go through our meetings uh, that we have as we're talking about their future, whether medical, physical therapy, nursing, or, or pharmacy school, or whatever. Uh, so you go into Pre-Residency Audio Academy, uh, then this pops up, you scroll down, and then you get to hear free general resources, and then I have chances of matching by interview number, and I put this PDF in there. So let me show you what I've done. And again, this is just a thought experiment, how I would kind of approach it and give myself some odds so that I could uh, kind of have a good understanding of what I should do in terms of applying for jobs uh, versus how much should I count on getting a residency. So the big kind of take home from this is that the average number of applications that someone sends out are 11. And of those, you get about three interviews. So you're talking about 27% of the time somebody will get an interview. But where you are going to school and how many interviews you get, I think matters quite a bit. So here's the top 25 schools in the country. Uh, UNC, oh, in terms of match, or let me go back to this. It is the top 25 schools in the country, match rate, that means that each person here got an interview. Uh, and we're not counting the 1,400 students that did not get any interview at all um, last year. So again, PGY1, first, uh, it's just the first round, phase one, uh, and uh, these are the top 25 schools. So UNC, Oklahoma, Wyoming, Michigan, Rutgers, top five. New Mexico, Deuville, Wisconsin, UCSD, and Montana, then Rhode Island, Toledo, New England, Ohio Northern, and Wilkes. Then Union, Arkansas, Utah, Georgia, MUSC, or Medical University of South Carolina. And then University of Kentucky, Kansas, uh, MCPHS, Manchester, Cincinnati, and Finley. Now you say, well, that doesn't sound like the U.S. News and World Report Top 25, and it absolutely isn't. It's not even close. U.S. News and World Report extremely skews their uh, rankings towards public schools and away from private schools because I'm going to guess that a huge amount of uh, what they bring in or the way they grade them is, is the research dollars that they bring in. But let's talk about how if you're in one of these top 25 schools, and then I have the whole list on the PDF, uh, how we can kind of do a quick and dirty, like, okay, well, what are my chances? Well, I think that you, to get the match rate of your school, I feel like that you have to be at the average. So the average, again, is three interviews per 11 applications. And if you're at that three interviews, I think at UNC, I think you can say, okay, well, I probably have an 86% chance to match. Uh, and then it just only goes down from there. But I think that as you move up, you know, okay, well, I've got four interviews instead of three. I don't know that it necessarily goes up a ton. So again, this is just a thought experiment. I said, okay, well, let's give about 2% for each interview over three uh, to say that you're going to match because really 86 to 88 to 90 to 92, all the way up to rounding up to 100%, uh, that's, you know, there, there's just not much place to go from that 86. It's just so high. But on the left-hand side, I think that if you are at UNC and you only got two interviews out of 11, I think that's telling you something. And, and so I gave quadruple penalty for that. So I said, we're going to lower it about 8%. And then if you only got one interview and you applied to 11 sites, I think that's really telling you a lot. Now, the match rate is so high that I think you still have a, probably a two out of three chance to get uh to get that residency with that single interview if you're at UNC or Oklahoma or Wyoming or Michigan or Rutgers. Um, but I think that uh, it's definitely going giving you some feedback that you only got one interview out of 11. And what I'm going to guess happened is that one of your recommenders really sunk you and that one of the sites or two of the sites maybe said, okay, well, 
you know, this one person says they wouldn't, but let's bring them in and, and talk to them and, and kind of find out what happened there. Um, but the other thing I might say is that your documents were not very good. So what happened was you maybe you, you put a lot of thought and effort into the first three or four. And then the letters of intent got pretty generic after that, and, and that, that caused that to happen. So uh, either paper or people uh, is what I say is usually the what sinks you in, in uh, phase one. But let's look a little bit at these numbers and, and what happens. So as you kind of go down, you see the match rates go down just a little bit, you know, 86%, 85, 83, 82, and obviously you'd love to be at any of these schools. Um, you'll notice that some of the big hitters uh, are not here, and it may be a little bit weird to see Kentucky down at 21, but we are talking about phase one, and the more people you send in, like Wisconsin and Kentucky are sending in almost a hundred people, as is UNC. And the more people you have in a school, the harder it is to have enough spots for all of those people. But what really happens once you get kind of to the bottom tier, and I'm not going to show the bottom tier on this video. That you know, they not only do they know who they are, but I you know I have it on the document. You can look at it. But what happens with the bottom tier is that, okay, well, let's say you are the best person at your school in one of the bottom tier schools, but somebody from UNC and somebody from Oklahoma and somebody from Michigan all applied there too. Well, what are your chances of getting ranked higher than those three people, especially if there's a tie? And there are so many ties uh, in when, when it comes to trying to evaluate these residents, and, and some of it just goes off gut feel. So... You know, this document's there. It's available to you if you think it's going to help you. Uh, again, I, I just want to be able to use it so that I can talk to pre-pharmacy students and kind of explain uh, what the difference is between going to a certain school and their chances in the first round, phase one, of the PGY1 match. So uh, I'm still helping people with their interviews. A uh, big thing that I, I've started helping people with is are their presentations. I, I'm just kind of taken aback at how amazing some of these presentations have been so much creativity and so much thought put into them but i'm also kind of a little disappointed that many of the applicants have kind of left this as something that they're just going to do during the process and those powerpoints are looking pretty poor and i you know i can we blame the schools well let me put it this way when we, when we talk about um, those classes that you get, so many schools have the, the residency class, the, the question is, is that are you in a residency class with a select group? Or are you with a rec group? And I know I make a bunch of references to soccer, but I think this is really an apt group. So when you're at UNC or Oklahoma or Wyoming or Michigan or Rutgers, and if you were in one of these residency prep classes, the people that you're comparing yourself to are just have all of these credentials. And so your game is way up there. And so when you're you know making a presentation and they're making a presentation, these presentations are just super high quality uh, and everything is just you know rock star. And you know when you when you're kind of comparing yourself and to, to the other applicants, you're like, wow, you know okay, well, to be at the top, I need to do this, this and this. When you're at the bottom, you're like a rec team. And what I mean by that is, in my, my daughters play rec basketball, and you know, they just had a 20 to two win, and they feel pretty good about themselves. But if they were to go into the competitive league, I, I think that that number would, might even be reversed, where they would get two, and then the other team would get 20. And the problem is, is that at the lower tier schools that are, are you know, um, amongst the highest accepting schools, that is, they accept the greatest percentage of their applicants, uh, the competition is just not stiff. And because they haven't had those stressors and the, and the, to show them like, no, this is what an application to a top residency should look like, that it doesn't matter. They can be the best of their class, but they're still barely competing with the worst of the best. And I don't mean to say that in a way that's derogatory, but I'm just saying that, look, once you kind of put the, um, 
the acceptance rate, you know, in the high 80s, you know, getting towards the 90s, uh, there's going to be significant deficits in areas. And one of those areas is in professional communication. And what I mean by that is writing, presenting, communicating in that way. And really, that's more to the fault of the pre-pharmacy curriculum as being so, so science-based, you know, two organics, two chemistries, two biologies, anatomy, physiology, maybe physics, calculus, that the liberal arts, those classes where they would have a chance to learn how to make a web page, to learn how to do a PowerPoint presentation, to learn how to use... Uh, you know, good transition in paragraphs, uh, you know, just really writing intensive assignments are, are completely, you know, that, that curriculum is completely devoid of that. And so when they get to this, which is a very rhetorical uh, experience, uh, that is, you've got a lot of presentations and a lot of writing and a lot of communication that you need to do from the interview to posters to, to whatever, that I think that... Um, that's where it's really coming in. And you're going to see as we go from, I think this graduating class came in at 82%. And as we go in four years to the 88%, I think those deficits are going to become even more extreme where you know, the ability to write clearly at a high level, to present at a high level is is just missing. And that nowhere through the process were they really given somebody who's gonna be like, okay, I need you to write a 10 page paper with 30 sources. Uh, that just doesn't happen. It just takes a lot of time to do those types of things uh, in the liberal arts. So I'm you know, kind of on a stump here for the liberal arts, but uh, it's just only going to get worse. And, and the problem is, is that when you know, I talk to my wife and the things that she has to do, well, she's presenting to physicians and nurses, and I tell you, they're not going to have any tolerance for, oh, well, I can't really read that font, or you put this color against the background and you can't read it. You know, They're absolutely not going to put up with that. So what happens is when you go through the residency interview process, the residency interview process is really a test of your language skills. Okay, how articulate is your written and oral English? You know, are you understandable? Are, are, you know, can you put together a slide deck that articulates some kind of clinical uh, experience that you've had in a way that we would be happy to present to our medical staff here? You know, can you get a letter written that articulates what you've done over the last four years and how much uh, that matches up to what we offer. These are very English class based assignments. And the more people that come in based on their ability to pass organic chemistry and the fewer obstacles and challenges we have for them to get in based on their ability to communicate clearly the more that the residency process is going to be the true admissions process. And I think that's a little bit unfair to tell somebody after they just spent $200,000, well, that wasn't the real test. This is the real test. Uh, and these are the skills you need. It's like, well, if I knew these were the skills I needed, I would have worked on them in school. And the thing is that uh, many of the courses during pharmacy school are not based on writing papers and it just is and those papers that are written people are told oh well well don't worry about the grammar and the syntax and that much you know so all right well i gotta get off this stump anyway the, the whole point of this this uh, podcast was to tell you that the, you know the, the match rate if you if you want to earn your school's match rate i think that's about at three interviews uh if you're at two or one interview i think there's going to be some level of penalty that your percentage is going to be quite a bit lower and then as you move up, I think there's going to be an incremental linear movement from uh, three interviews to, to 11. And again, if you only apply to, to six places, I would just maybe double it. So I'd say, OK, well, um, if I got six out of six, that would be like where the 10 is. And if I got three out of six, that would be where the six is or the five is and something like that. So uh, need my help, Tony, the pharmacist at gmail.com. Uh, but I will talk to you soon.